Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et honorum mortis nostri. Amen. Domine Padre, in Christ, Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Yes. Indeed. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to the Monday Morning Man Show. It's the Terror of Demons Morning Show with co host and author of the book, Kennedy Hall, and co host, Paleocrat. Today we have the topic that you've all been waiting for. Kennedy Hall is going to convince everyone that Archbishop Lefebvre is the new doctor of the church. Um, what you what what, the, what was the title again? <laughs> uh, everything, everything you've ever heard about the SSBX is wrong. Yes. So Kennedy Hall is. Um, yeah. Have you announced what you're working on, Kennedy? Hmm. Right now. Have you, right oh, now he well. just, well. Right now he did through you. <laughs> right now. Um, yeah. So I've started writing, I'm in the preliminary stages of writing a book about Marcel Lefebvre. And uh, the working title is Marcel Lefebvre Contra Mundum. And, um, and uh, it'll be a, if you've ever read the biography of St. Francis of Assisi by Chesterton, a uh, loosely chronological sketch presented in the form of basically essays that's kind of how, how that book is so you know definitely it goes through saint francis of assisi's life in a in a way but you could also kind of take one chapter pick it up put it down and then it's more about like the meaning of an aspect of francis's life if that makes sense and uh, versus a strict documentarian sketch right that's just not my goal um Goal is to have it be around 150, 170 pages, so very readable. Anyway, in the preliminary stages right now, and uh, so stay tuned. Excellent. Well, yeah. well, we'll get some of your research today, so we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We are, it's the fourth Sunday after Easter. We're in the, the second part of Paschal Tide. Paschal Tide lasts for a total <clears throat> of 56 days through the octave of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And there's part one of Easter, which is celebrating the resurrection, the destruction of death, and the conquering mm -hmm. of Christ. And then we have the second part of Easter, which is when our Lord is warning us about his departure and his ascension into heaven and the descent of the Holy Ghost. So the fourth, fourth Sunday of Easter. Um, to Later today, we have we, so we have St. Ubald, St. Pascal Balion, uh, Venantius, Peter Celestine, St. Peter Celestine, is the other pope who renounced the throne hmm. i just remember that because of this icon here because he's got the benedictine robe but he's got the 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 keys and the and the papal robe that he took off right here um on saturday we also have the the new martyrs um cristero martyrs hmm. saint christopher magallanes and his companions from uh 1915 1928 in mexico those are the great martyrs um, fighting against the communists in Mexico, the first communist revolution of the world. Um, and later today on, actually it'll be on the one Peter five podcast, but we'll repost it. It's going to be, and priest disobey with Peter Kwasniewski. That's going to be about his new book. That'll be relevant also for our discussion here. I, Peter Kwasniewski has a new book about true obedience to God in the situation that we're in. We'll talk about that. We're also going to be on Thursday, meeting of Catholic. We'll talk to um, the CEO of Romanitas Press about the 1955 mm. Holy Week. Oh, that's going to be interesting. That's the trads' heads are going to explode there. It's going to yes. be you have tomatoes thrown at you and everything. 
Yeah, so that'll be good because we have another aspect of the 55 Holy Week is coming up with the Pentecost vigil because that's also part of the whole thing. Um, so we'll talk about that on Thursday. Mm. Uh, we'll also have the Guild family stream that'll be on Friday. Just uh, open conversation. So if you <clears> want to be a part of the online guild, that's patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic where you can donate. Or if you can't afford it, contact us. It's a guild. So um kennedy what's going on with the with tkr this week hmm. well i was away at the march for life last week um and uh in fact if you want to see <laughs> we, we did a little bit of a uh, matt walsh or fleckus you ever watch that guy fleckus talks like these guys that go around and they talk to these crazy wackos at like women's marches and stuff we did um a little bit of that up there and i went and interviewed i've interviewed a satanist um these people that were anti anti life protesters, right? Who were uh, uh, anyway? It was just crazy. A bunch of these screaming pro abort supporters surrounded me and were telling me that babies were parasites and all this kind of stuff. And I just trying to trying to do one little quippy little one liners, you know, for a film sort of thing. And uh, so there's a video at LifeSite um, about it. Uh, LifeSite new or John Henry Weston's YouTube channel. It's also on Rumble. They have a LifeSite channel there, but. Um, that was pretty good. Ottawa was crazy. It was um, it was the craziest I've ever seen it. There you go. Yeah, but in spite of the guy in in the video, it's a decent video. But um, <clears throat> it was bananas. I've never seen something like it, it, we we've never really had a culture war in Canada, if that makes sense. Um, so it was actually really edifying to see there was a, like an actual battle there um, because the pro-choice side looked so bananas, insane. Um, and the pro-lifers were just like, you know, singing songs and holding hands and, and like saying prayers and like telling people that they were loved. <laughs> like it was like the craziest dichotomy I've ever seen. It was people literally screaming about hailing Satan and babies are parasites. And there was like women with beards. It was just crazy. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was like, uh, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah on the one side. And, uh, and then there's like, you know, rosaries and, and hymns on the other side. Anyway. So that was really cool. So I didn't get much done with um, my channel last week. Just had that one video on the SSPX, which has done pretty well. But then next, this week, I'm going to get back to it. I don't know what I'm going to talk about yet. Although people ask me to talk about more SSPX stuff, so I'll probably do some of that. Um, but stay tuned. Sweet. Yeah, I'm glad that they had you uh, do these interviews. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what's what's the what's the new with the presupposition? Pre, 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 yeah, you, that thing. What are you talking about again? I forgot. Presuppositionalism, Catholic presuppositionalism, and I've been making the case. Uh, today is episode nine uh, of the series. I did. Um, I, I began the series talking about uh, Saint Irenaeus and talking about what we can learn from his methodology, what he advanced as a methodology, and I followed that up with talking about the book here. Right. The Catholic controversy and how that same methodology is at play in this. And so rather than going through, because this would be quite a long series if I was doing it every chapter for this one. But today I'm going to talk about how uh, it's not only applied, as we demonstrated in the last couple episodes, how it's not only applied when talking to um, Protestants. Right. Talking about Lutherans or Presbyterians. He was directing it toward the Calvinists, but also. Uh, today's episode is going to be dealing with Sedevacantism and showing mm. how, because Sedevacantists will often use quotes from St. Francis de Sales and even from this book. And so I'm going to demonstrate not only that that's in, entirely uh, cherry picking the daylights out of the great saint, um, but it's untenable and that his view would make uh, mincemeat out of them. <laughs> that, in fact, people saying things like they're saying are exactly the kind of people that he had in mind. Um, even for the future, when he said that he hopes that these letters, that they could provide a, a method of re-evangelizing those people who've walked away from the faith. And I would include set of a contest in that. So it's going to be a very, very big one on can the church error um, and can it be destroyed? And it specifically talking about the Pope, specifically talking about papal authority on matters of faith, morals, government and discipline. So that's, that's today. And then the rest of the week, we're talking uh, d different things. Ron uh, Ronald Knox talking about what he anticipated in kind of the uh, secular age, the specter of the secular age that was looming <laughs> in the, off in the distance that he saw coming and what he anticipated regarding 
uh, a real mega shift in uh, the Catholic apologetic world. Sweet. Well, that that'll be highly relevant to what we're talking about. So we'll have the true obedience show and we'll have the paleocrat show. We'll have all the points discussed on all these things. F fantastic. All right. Uh, so, Kennedy, where do you want to go with this? Everything you've heard about the SSPX is wrong. Sure. Um, so the other day, the reason I was motivated to talk about this is because I watched the um, debate on Matt Frad's channel between Jeff Kasman and a fellow named, I believe, Andrew Bartell. I think that's his name. Um, and it was uh, kudos to Matt Frad. You don't have to host SSPX debates if you're already an established mainstream apologist. It's not going to increase your net worth. Let's put it that way. Um, so he did it, I think, just because he has integrity and wanted to do something good, which I was very appreciative of. It was nice to see. And Matt made it very clear that he does not believe, I actually have a screen cap of it, just if it wants evidence, um, that uh, he says the SSP, he, he believes the SSP is not in schism, um, which also Rome believes. But anyway, so I, um, as I was watching the debate, a couple things struck me. For one, it's very strange we're still having a debate about whether or not the SSPX is in schism when it's not even a thing that's a, it's not even never, it's never been declared that the society per se was in schism. So even if you believed the, the, um, the, even if you believe John Paul II's letter as being accurate, et cetera, from 1988, it wouldn't apply to the society as a whole. So saying the SSPX is in schism has actually never been a thing that the church has ever declared. So that's kind of, I, I realized that I, to myself, I thought, wow, there's been, I hate the term misinformation because it's just a leftist term to say anything right wingers believe is wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, it's been something that's been bandied about for a long time um, that the SSPX per se is in schism. Anyway, I was watching this debate between these two guys, and it was a very strange debate. Um, basically, the argument on behalf of this fellow, Mr. Bartell, was that there was a sickness in the SSPX. It was like a disease. He, he used, used those terms. Um, that was a schismatical disease and caused people to leave the church. Um, he said there was no evidence that it was canonically in schism. He wasn't going to argue that point. And when Jeff Caspin brought up canon law, he was like, you can't do that. We're not talking about that. <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, but he had this idea that being an, a, an attendee at the SSPX would, uh, in, uh, would Im implement in you or imbibe in you sort of a schismatical spirit and that the priests themselves had this schismatical spirit. Um, it was a very strange line, line of argumentation, especially for a layman to make about a group of people. I thought it was, I didn't think it was very charitable to be honest. Um, so anyway, I just, I thought to myself, I'm like, well, this is not my experience. You know, yesterday my son Titus received his first Holy Communion at the society and he was wearing a white suit and cowboy boots. So he's congratulations. Like, um, Thank you. And um, I have I have never encountered anyone in my experience that ever wants to set up a parallel church or doesn't believe. Um, to be honest, I don't even know any. I don't even know any committed Benny Plenists at the SSBX, to be honest, like, you know, let alone at say days. I mean, the state of a was preached against often actually in the SSPX and catechism courses and things like that, be, just to be sure it's like, we are not those and we will never be those. That's kind of like the, the opinion. So I just, you know, I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning with the SSPX um, and try to make the case that I think uh, there's something about it that's providential um, and that it's been a, a benefit to the church. Um, because schism is a very particular thing. This is why these terms have to be used very specifically. You know, historically, schism has always been believed to be basically setting up a parallel church, you know, uh, uh, rejecting the Roman primacy per se. Um, disobedience is not schism. All schismatics, in a way, are disobedient, but disobedience is not always schism, right? Um, so uh, this idea that the SSPX would be in schism, um, there's just no evidence that they themselves are in schism. They've never set up a parallel church. They've never set up a diocese. 
Uh, they've never stopped communicating with Rome. They've never stopped praying for the Roman pontiff in their mass. They've never stopped praying for the local bishops in their mass. Uh, they've never stopped, uh, you know, before, for example, when there was universal uh, permission for priests to hear certain confessions without having to appeal to Rome as it was in the past for certain sins. Um, when that, when they had to appeal to Rome, they would, and they would receive letters from Rome or were saying, yeah, it's all good, you know, good for you. Um, they've always had this relationship with Rome, no matter how contentious it's been. It's not schism is my point. Okay, so uh, in 1968, so there's sort of an act of providence at the beginning of the life of the Society of St. Pius X. So on April 11th, 1968, it was Maundy Thursday, and uh, there was a little cafe in a Swiss village near Econ, which is where the, sem the international seminary is today. And there was a, a fellow named Alphonse Pedroni, and he was basically a Swiss businessman. And he was sitting in a cafe, and he overheard another businessman boasting about how he was going to buy this property at a cone, and he was going to blow the thing up and develop it into a nightclub and a hotel. And um, this fellow Pedroni was a faithful Catholic, and at that time, the... Um, monastery at Acon was under the uh, care of the canons of St. Bernard, from whom we get the dog, the St. Bernard, um, which I actually believe is a little bit providential because uh, we've been told we're in a new springtime, but in fact, it's been pretty much a deadly winter. And we have these priests of the SSPX who were formed at the home of the St. Bernard who have gone out there and rescued people from, from the cold on their way on their pilgrimage to Rome, because that's what the St. Bernards were actually um, bred for, was they were to save pilgrims who were crossing these passes over the Alps. Um, it's another little Canadian connection. Ooh, uh, the St. Nice. Bernard's dog was going to be out of existence because they were saving so many people but dying in so many avalanches <laughs> um, that they didn't have, uh, it was a very small breed at the time, very small gene pool. So they brought in the Newfoundlanders from the New World, uh, so there you go, my friends. Um, um, but uh, anyway, so eventually what happened was uh, this fellow, Alphonse, Alphonse Padroni, he got a few of his buddies to agree to buy this, and they got it from under underfoot from the, uh, from the businessman. They just bought it, and they said, we don't want this place to become a whorehouse, basically. This is uh, there's a devotion in that part of Switzerland called Our Lady of Fields, of the Fields. Um, this monastery has been around for hundreds of long long time and it's just very important so they bought it they bought it from the canons of saint john uh, canons of saint bernard they didn't know what to do with it they just we have it now it's not going to be a den of iniquity um fast forward in the same year 1968 something incredible happens terrible happens at uh the french seminary in rome the french seminary in rome where marcel lefebvre had gone to seminary and where the uh, inestimable Father Lafloche, who was probably one of the greatest, uh, let's say, theologians or scholars on the rights of Christ the King in the in the 20th century, he um, <clears throat> at the seminary there in 1968, the French seminary uh, flew a communist flag from the main balcony in support of the revolutionary students in Paris. So not just. Uh, not just a political thing, not just supporting Biden, that's bad enough, but an actual communism flag. And um, <clears throat> so uh, the French seminary had, it sucked <laughs> uh, at that point, you know, let's put it that way. Uh, you don't get to the, I mean, where, where you have to be to fly a communist flag is actually crazy. I mean, you think about, it's like, we're just going to fly the commie flag today, boys, you know, no problem. Okay, we'll hang that out there. So about, 11, about nine or was it nine? I think it was nine. Um, seminarians who had entered the seminary as Catholics uh, and didn't want to leave the seminary as communists, they decided that they couldn't continue their formation in the seminary. You remember what month that was in 1968? <clears throat> May. <clears throat> May, okay. Cause that's I actually like, believe it was around the same time. Okay, because that's May, and then I think it's June or July is the credo, and then <laughs> like September is Humanae Vitae, I think. Yes, yes. So 68 is a big year. It's a huge year. Um, and I believe that was the same year. No, it wasn't the same year that um, Aldo Moro was killed. Uh, Paul, Paul VI. Is, anyway, uh, there was a lot going on with um, stuff in Rome. Okay, same year. 
1968. At this time, Marcel Lefebvre is the superior of the Holy Ghost Fathers. Now, if you like Cardinal Seurat, thank a Holy Ghost Father. Um, I think Cardinal Seurat's grandparents were worshipping totem poles, um, and uh, the Holy Ghost Fathers, Marcel Lefebvre and, and his compatriots, I would imagine, I, I don't even know, maybe Marcel Lefebvre did interact with Cardinal Seurat as a child. He might have. There's something we should probably look into. Um, that part of West Africa, French-speaking Africa, was the Holy Ghost Fathers' missionary territory, um, and the Holy Ghost Fathers converted millions. Um, anyway, in 1968, though, Lefebvre was the superior of the Holy Ghost Fathers. And what did they do that year? They changed their constitution to be in line with the spirit of Vatican II, so on and so forth. And Lefebvre uh, was like, well, this is modernist. And uh, there was a lot more going on there. Um, yeah, 1970, exactly. Thank you. Um, there was a lot going on there. Um, why he decided to resign. He was he was 65 or so, and he had battled like crazy. I mean, he literally beat malaria in Africa. I think, I think twice he battled in the Second Vatican Council, and then he sees this order being taken over, and he said, I just got to get out. This is a young man's game. Okay, so these nine or so seminarians come to him and say, you know, Father Lefebvre, Bishop Lefebvre, will you please help us become Catholic priests? What can we do? So he says, sure, I'll, I'll come out of retirement to sort of do something here. And uh, within short order, they were in need of a property when they established this new priestly society. And what did they get? They got this old monastery at Econ. Um, so the reason can I, I tell can I add something? Yes. I, I just wanted to say before he left the Holy Ghost Fathers, he literally says in, in his biography, let us have a giornamento but not like the modernists. So he yeah. was actually trying to update in a good way to adapt to the modern world, but it was a totally orthodox. Uh, so that was something that I was just surprised to find out in his biography. It's a very moderate approach, which was not this sort of rigid reactionary. Yeah, honestly, I mean, the Flafev, I mean, it was a moderate in the, in the true sense of the term, in the golden mean sense of the term, you know, in the sense of, of, of uh, anyway. So, um, the reason I tell this story, though, is because, you know, by the foundations of a thing, they they make clear the motivation of a thing. So the, the Society of St. Pius X, in essence, was established is as a response and as a pastoral, in this age of pastoral, <laughs> as a pastoral response to the needs of the faithful. Um, in the truest sense of the word, it wasn't his pet project. He was, uh, at that time... Lefebvre had already procured an apartment in Rome where he was just going to be a scholar. He was quite the quite a quite an author and stuff, and he was just going to go and study. I mean, he was just going to sort of be a retired bishop. <clears throat> um, but at 65, he was called back into the fray. And uh, he writes here, um, it says, uh, I said to these gentlemen that wanted to force me to do something for the seminarians, asking me to take care of them personally. I'm going to see Bishop Charrier. If he tells me, go ahead, then I will see it as a sign from the will of God. So Lefebvre was extremely sensitive to providence. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. He was a Holy Ghost father. He was formed. I mean, we have this sort of charismatic renewal, which has sort of, you know, taken the monopoly on what the Holy Ghost is supposed to be like in your life. But Lefebvre's whole formation was of the Holy Ghost Fathers. Uh, he never did anything if he didn't believe that it was a sign of providence. You know, it was, we will pray, we will get a sign. When we have a sign, we will act. If we don't get the sign, we won't act. Very, very traditional, simple faith, you know. And um, so he, and then he said, uh, he said this, I said this, he says, because I really didn't want to, meaning he didn't want to do this, you know, new endeavor. I was, uh, I felt old and I was sure that I could not undertake such work. When you are 65 years old, you do not undertake a work like the one of the society. Had somebody told me the number of priests and what the society would become today, I would just have smiled sweetly. So I didn't want to, but Bishop Chatelier instead, and this is the bishop of uh, the area where the, the seminarians were asking, he says, il faut, il faut, you must, you must, fit, fit, do it, do it, do something, rent a house, don't abandon these seminarians, you know what's going on in the church, we need absolutely to keep the good traditions. So this was his sign. Um, the society is therefore not a personal work, it would never have been blessed by God as it has been, it was definitely a work of God. So this is the, this is the testimony of Lefebvre about the beginnings. This is very important. Um, because we, we, I've heard things, uh, 
you know, Lefebvre is, 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 is the new Luther. I mean, I've heard this before, which is just insane. Um, uh, I've heard uh, even Warren Carroll, amazing scholar. He, there's an article of his on EWTN, uh, something I've, I've read it. I've, I've, I'm going to cite it in my book, but it's something like, um, you know, the society had the followers of Lefebvre have no more right than the followers of, of Martin Luther. I'm like, my goodness gracious, I wouldn't I wouldn't speak about John Calvin and compare him to Luther. I wouldn't be that insulting to the man. You know, um, there's just something there's there's I don't think there's an understanding that people have about what the society is, how it began and what the, even the motivations are. And if we don't, you know, that famous sermon that went viral from from Father Altman about how the society doesn't know God, therefore they can't love God. If we don't know Lefebvre, if we don't know the beginnings of the society, then I don't even think we can really attempt to talk about it in a way that gives justice. Um, he didn't, he had permission from Rome. So the, this is a question from Phil Gonzalez. So to start in a society of apostolic life or a Pio Unio or something like that, um, you don't have to go directly to Rome. You start things in a diocese. So he went to a diocese and he got providential sign from there. And then, then it begins from there. That's how these things uh, begin. Some people do go directly to Rome. Francis of Assisi did, but he was ridiculed. <laughs> it's like, you don't, he, I mean, it was very, uh, um, the way he was very forthright. He just was naive and went to Rome and waited there and sat in a room for like two weeks until the Pope got back and asked him, can I start a thing? And he's like, you don't do it this way. It's kind of part of the lore of Francis of Assisi. Um, but you start things in the normal way where you go through the channels of your diocese and so on and so forth. So he did something near the Diocese of Freeburg. Anyway, so that's the beginnings of the SSPX. And uh, I've been talking for a long time. So if anyone else wants to say anything, the, now is your chance. Sure. Uh, Paleocrat, what are your comments? Um, first of all, I watched the debate involving Kassman. Um, I don't want to cast shade on him as a guy. Right. Because there's enough of that that people wrote that I don't think is very charitable, even if true um, about his past, stuff like that, um, or his character and quality of character. Um, but there were certain things that were said that kind of were brought up here. Like he mentioned also that this, the SSPX doesn't forbid people to attend other masses. They don't have that authority. But the website has 62 reasons why in conscience we cannot attend the new mass. Uh, Father, should I attend this mass? Verdict on attending the FSSP. Um, these people can go and look for themselves and find out what do they say about that? There was a time you can see it on the archive, uh, where you weren't supposed to even go to the FSSP. But I think really what I want to just say is that I think there's two, I think there are two, like, I don't want to say extremes, but like two sides of this coin, right? Where one people who are very fervent about it, uh, or people who are very, um, committed to, um, the SSPX a lot of times kind of downplay some of the things that he may have said that came across in a way that was very disturbing. On the other side, there are people who cannot even recognize the otherwise saintly character and qualities of uh, Marcel Lefebvre, which is unquestionable. Regardless of what I may personally think, uh, I may disagree with certain things that he did, um, but he's an archbishop and he did things in his life that... Um, there he would be worthy of sainthood i mean it, it, there's just to me there's no doubt about it about that about him however um there are things that he said that give reason to why people would bring up martin luther for example um in his retreat conference on september 4th 1987 he said rome has lost the faith my dear friends rome is an apostasy these are not words in the air it is a truth rome is an apostasy they've left the church this is sure 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 um, if people remember Luther at Worms, uh, Rome lost the faith. The councils have contradicted. The popes have contradicted. That is what he said. And he said that unless he's compelled and convinced by scripture and by conscience, he would take his stand. So help him God. That's what he said. Um, there are definitely echoes of that in this. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about it. It's about popes contradicting. It's about the council contradicting. It's about Rome losing the faith. He says to publicly be uh, to be publicly associated with the sanction of excommunication would be a mark of honor and a sign of orthodoxy before the faithful. I don't know in history really anybody that would say that if they weren't a schismatic. 
I mean, that's, you know, have a strict right to know that the priests they approach are not in communion with the counterfeit church. Um, many saints would say to talk that way is blasphemous. Um, also to say, uh, I should be very happy to be excommunicated from this conciliar church. It's a church that I do not recognize. I belong to the Catholic church. Um, we've never wished to belong to this system that calls itself the conciliar church. To be excommunicated by a decree of your eminence would be irrefutable proof that we do not. We ask for nothing better than to be declared uh, excommunione, uh, excluded from impious communion with infidels. Um, as I said, in history, only schismatics talk that way about the church. Nobody who says that wins, by the way. I don't know anybody who talked that way about the Pope and who talked about being excommunicated by Rome, who they're the winners and that they come out looking good. Um, and so I think that I'm only bringing those things up, not to say that he stood by them forever. Okay. Because they're, I think that if you look at the years that he said these things, even talking about, you know, maybe there is no Pope. And so it's possible we may be obliged to believe that this is not the Pope, right? That sort of a thing that he said that in certain times of his life at other times in the end, Ask Chikata, well, you can't now, Chikata's dead, but he's got videos out there about this topic. And you could easily ask and say, well, how did he end up? Well, Chikata would have to say, as he did, um, he ended up kicking us out, <laughs> right? So the Sedes were booted, right? That kind of a thing. So there was a line for him that may have gone back and forth at times, that may have at sometimes been okay, where they were allowed in. and But at the end of the day, which is really what matters, to be frank, at the end of the day, he ended up booting them. The last thing I'll say is this, is that the idea of like, you know, they didn't want to set up a rival church. For one, um, he's kind of saying that's already there, right? That's the, first of all. But it really has to do a lot with the idea of a rival altar. That's the real thing. A rival altar in history has been seriously problematic. That And just because you pray for the local bishop, um, and, you know, it's it's told that when they come in, it was said in the debate when they come into town, you know, they typically like to go and talk to the bishop. But that's not normal. In fact, that's not very trad because that bishop has a juridical authority there. He's the ordinary and you don't do anything. I mean, even St. Francis in his in Catholic controversies, you don't do anything um, in that area without the ordinary. I mean, you to just roll into town, that would be an, a kind of extraordinary mission to say. I'm showing up here with a chapel that's not designated by this bishop as a sacred space. There's a rule to that. And so to just roll up into that jurisdiction and to begin having a mass and peeling people away, which is inevitably what's going to happen, right? More people will come from other, from parishes and go over there and become identified exclusively with that, where they refuse to even commune anymore with the bishop. They won't commune because it's the Novus Ordo. They won't commune with the bishop. They wouldn't commune with the Pope if he was in town. They might, they might not, you know, for whatever reason. But the idea is it's a rival altar. And because it's a rival altar, it at least fits in to this. And the idea in the comments, somebody said, they said, the Catholic faith of my father and my mother and their ancestors is not schismatic. I just want to just put in there as just a note that the Donatists has said that, the Jansen has said that, the Eastern Orthodox say that, and so do the old Catholics. All four of those groups say the exact same thing. They say that it changed, that Rome changed its position, that Rome did not have the authority to change that position, and that in changing that position, if they left that, and the donors of, of all of them would have the biggest claim. They'd say, look at the wickedness. People were martyred and killed for the scrolls. The, the Romans came in, didn't want the scrolls. The people who were afraid to die gave the scrolls over to them, and they were burned. Other people died, martyred, friends, family, everybody, leaders. And then after it quieted down, the church allowed them to just come in willy-nilly, not just to only come in, but also to allow them to continue being leaders of areas. And they said, that's completely foreign to anything we've ever done. We didn't, Our rules for, for that sort of apostasy was way different. And they said, we're holding fast to the faith of our fathers. But at the end of the day, they didn't have the authority to make that call. And, and they ended up, as I said, in history, like the other groups, they ended up being deemed schismatic. So I would just put those up there. Um, you know, I would say that is, 
Um, in the question, David asked me, Paleocrat, who did change? Is it the Tridentine Mass, the Mass of St. Peter? Um, the Mass of St. Peter is the Tridentine Mass as you understand it today is fake history. But the idea that it's the same thing, that if you went back 2,000 years ago, it would be just like going to the SSPX. That's very <clears throat> fake. Um, so I don't, that's not a very good argument. But I understand. I understand what you're saying, though. The idea of like who changed what. Um, that's not really the question, though. The question is, who has the authority in this situation to make the final call no matter what? Any appeal that SSPX would have, and this is the last thing, I'm sorry it talks so long. The SSPX, any, dis any difference that they would have, there's a buck stop somewhere, right? And that buck stop somewhere is, in fact, Rome. So whether we like it or not, that is the buck stop. That's, that's what St. Francis de Sales calls the invincible argument would be Matthew 18, because you have a problem with your brother, talk it out. If you can't resolve it, two or three witnesses. If you can't resolve it, go to the church. If you don't submit to the church, you're a heathen and a tax collector. Yeah. Excellent. Kennedy, thoughts? Okay, so there's a lot there. So I wrote some yeah, notes. Yeah. Okay, so first, the term conciliar church was not coined by Marcel Lefebvre. It was coined by a cardinal who used the, concili the term conciliar church to... To, to show a dichotomy between what was believed before the council and after the council. So when Lefebvre says he does not belong to the conciliar church, what he's saying is he does not belong to this idea that there is such thing as a conciliar church. I can't remember the fellow's name, but it was 1984, I believe, that the term was used. It might have been earlier. Um, and it was uh, a cardinal of the church who basically said, we are now in the conciliar church. And Lefebvre was like, I don't belong to the conciliar church. I belong to the Catholic church. So all of his quotes about that need to be understood that way. Otherwise, it's just a misuse of terms, which many people do. Many, Again, many people, they look at these things from Lefebvre. They don't know the context of when he said them. Uh, next thing, um, this idea of the, um, what did you call it? The uh, alternative altar or something like that, the uh, rival altar. There was a saint named St. Eusebius of Samosote. And after he returned from exile during the Arian crisis, he went into the, the he was a retired bishop. And he went into diocese where he had no jurisdiction and he said these are all arians they're not fit to keep you the, they're not fit to teach you the faith many of them had not been declared arians they just they just uh, acted like arians and this was i don't know 40 years after saint athanasius or something and uh he went in and ordained bishops and priests and he said i have to do this because otherwise you won't get sound teaching and, and a sound faith um on the one hand that sounds very schismatic because he's setting up his own churches uh, or mass centers. He didn't maybe didn't call them parishes, and the society has never said in an official sense they're parishes. Um, they call them mass centers or chapels or whatever. But that's what a saint did, Saint uh, Eusebius of Samosote. And as far as the rhetoric that Lefebvre used, um, this is from Saint Athanasius. He says, uh, Who has lost and who has won in the struggle? The one who keeps the premises or the one who keeps the faith? Meaning, talking about the buildings. True, the premises are good when the apostolic faith is preached there. They are holy in every, uh, if everything takes place there in a holy way. You are the ones who are happy, who remain within the church by your faith, who hold firmly to the foundations of the faith, which has come down to you from apostolic tradition. And if an execrable jealousy has tried to shake it on a number of occasions, it has not succeeded. They are the ones who have broken away from it in the present crisis. No one ever will prevail against your faith, beloved brothers. And we believe that God will give us back our churches someday. Um, thus, they more violently, uh, the more violently they try to occupy the places of worship, the more they separate themselves from the church. They claim that they represent the church, but in reality, they are the ones who are expelling themselves from it and going astray. Even if Catholics' faithful tradition are reduced to a handful, they are not the ones who are. They are the ones who are the true church of Jesus Christ. Now, no. um, now, Saint uh, Arianism was one heresy. I wish we could deal with just one heresy. St. Pius X defined modernism as the synthesis of all of them. So now, obviously Athanasius did not have uh, something like canonical proof that every diocesan church he's speaking of is somehow an Arian thing. You know, when you're in a time of chaos, there's no way to have uh, complete precision with how you speak about all of the situations you're talking about. I mean, Athanasius, he could have been speaking in a place where it actually happened to be that one of the uh, 
one of the parishes was good, but it's just in general, there's a spirit of Arianism in a particular area. Okay. Lefebvre was convinced that there was a spirit of uh, modernism that had infiltrated the church. And he was correct. Uh, and he was correct because Pius X was correct. And, and, and the Pius X, 11th, 12th, you know, they fought valiantly. Benedict the 15th. I mean, they did what they could, but it was, a, it was a tidal wave. Okay. Now you mentioned the Donatists. Um, the Donatists re rejected specifically, essentially, that they were ordained validly, okay, um, or that they must not have been ordained validly because a priest wouldn't act that way or something like that. I mean, they went there. There, it is. It's like when you look at a saint who goes to the edges of heresy, like Saint Ignatius of Loyola. They go to the edge of it because they're saints. They're very creative, um, and then after some. Uh, investigation it's found that no they didn't go they didn't go to the edge of it they say within the bounds but there are people who said well these these jesuits are heretics you know and they had good reasons to believe they were heretics today sadly for different reasons um but um so you know the donis's thing it's it's definitely a, a, a parallel in a sense but they cross a certain line that you can't cross the jansenists same thing if you go the jansenists um you know I th when i think jansenists i think scrupulosity right um i have never I mean, the, 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 my experience in the SSPX is, is, is completely opposite of that. To be honest, I find uh, sort of the online trad movement, uh, a lot of priests who are not in the society, to almost be more Jansenist. And what I mean by that is, um, I hate to use the term fundamentalism because that, that's a stupid term to, to beat Bible-believing Christians over the head. But there's an aspect of, like, I'll listen to some of these really big priests who are preaching, and I'm like, you've just made a lot of private opinions into dogma um, mm -hmm. about morals and stuff. And it's like that, you know, yeah, there are certain saints, but they differ. And, and it, I, I find with the SSPX to be much more modern and all that stuff. And the Eastern Orthodox reject the papal primacy as such. Um, so that's 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 another. My only reason for bringing that up, yeah. um, and I, I'm glad you brought up the thing about the conciliar church. But the reason I only brought up those other groups wasn't to say that the issue is the same. Mm -hmm. But just that all of them are making the claim that they're holding fast to the faith of their fathers. Yes, and of course. All of them would talk to you for years on end about why. Exactly. So and they, I agree they, with they you. They made their stand on that. But I they did. The and, idea it's, about, and again, it's like with heretics. I mean, yeah. uh, there are some people who are believed to be heretics, and then it's proved that they're not. Mm -hmm. um, but they're the same. <laughs> this is why heretics are so admirable in a human sense is because they're very principled. Right. It's like so and so had courage. I mean, he yeah, stood up to I, the church, you know, which it's 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 like the difference between an angel and a fallen angel. Fallen angels are very impressive, but they're fallen, yeah. you know. Um, I also wanted to mention um the FSSP and Novus Ordo thing. So um the Society of St. Pius the Tenth does have videos and articles saying uh why they would not recommend you attend a particular mass. Things have also changed a lot in the last 20 or 30 years, which is why those things are on archives, for example. So I know, for example, that here in the in Canada, it's either in Calgary or Edmonton because there's FSSP in both and there's SSPX in both. I can't remember which one. But I know of people who left the FSSP because the priests were constantly preaching against that you could never attend the SSPX and to do so would be an act of schism. This was during mass. <clears throat> um which is wrong. It's that's not actually what the church teaches, and it's it's been that way since like 1991. That's been the case. It's been obvious. Um, I can't stand the turf wars. I couldn't care less to get into them. But what I'm saying is, it's not as if in this debacle in the last 30 years, 34 years, that it's like FSSP good and SSPX bad. You know the F. You know there is a there is um, there is a worry uh, in certain places that attending certain masses you may hear things that offend you. And they're also writing to the SSPX faithful per se. And, uh, you know, I, you know, for example, like my children, they don't know what the SSPX is. I mean, they'll learn one day. One of the reasons why I go there is because I don't want them to ever get into the nonsense about politics in the church. I just want them to go to mass and be Catholic, not have to worry about the, 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 the you know, the bishop coming down and saying, we're going to do an eco Vesper service, you know, on Monday, Thursday instead, which, you know, it's, I've yeah. seen that happen. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want them to hate the bishop. I just want them to love the bishop. I just want them to love the Pope. That's all they know. It's a very simple faith. That's one of the reasons why I appreciate it. I've never heard uh, the SSPX priest, a priest at the SSPX in my situation, ever even preach against Pope Francis. I've only ever heard them mention Pope Francis in a sermon to build him up, to say, we would like more of this from the Holy Father, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. um, whereas when I did go to the FSSP in Niagara one year, um, it was like, 
it was like Tiller Marshall's episode turned into a sermon. <laughs> um, I, I was at the ordination um, where Filet ripped up the letter from Rome about yeah. the, you did it right in front of thousands of people. Um, mm -hmm. I was the only person there who was a journalist who was there. there it said, don't take pictures. I have pictures to prove I, I was there. <laughs> um, I, I was very disobedient, but I also was out to be, to be frank, I was outside. I had not been going to church for a while. I was completely out. My buddy, wanted to bring me back in and so i applaud him He was one of the few people who still wanted to talk to me and he invited me to go and that was the place where he invited me to go on a road trip with him so i did but i i watched him rip it up um now what was it that he ripped up i'm just wondering it, it was a letter warning that doing a um it was a kind of conditional ordination a guy had left a diocesan church he'd already been ordained they brought him in they did the ordination the old rite uh, they warned him not to do that, that that would be wrong to do, uh, that they're not permitted to do such things. And he read it out loud to everybody, and then he ripped it up in front of the whole audience, and everybody cheered. So we, you may not see certain things. Some people may see certain things. But I, but here's what I would say. So I, you, you brought something up that I didn't know. Well, I knew, but it, I didn't factor it in. The conciliar church, just as a reminder to say again, the, the idea of where this came from and what mm -hmm. he may have been responding to, just for my, for my sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so I can't remember. It's in the biography, but okay. the term conciliar church was used by a cardinal to to explain that the church had changed since Vatican II, and now we were in the conciliar church, not the church that was pre-conciliar. I, I have and something I, on that. So um, it was, yeah, it was a response to that. But that's the reason insane, I, right? The reason, the only reason I brought it up, and I'll say this, I'm not going to go on. Just the only reason I brought it up is because he says we've been suspended um by the conciliar church and from the conciliar church to which we have no wish to belong they were suspended by the roman sea they're suspended not by the conciliar church if you want to say it's the conciliar church something other than the roman sea then it they had, they don't suspend they would not be able to suspend it would be the it would be the the pope that did this so he would be either listing it with in, in this situation the way that it's listed because of where the suspension came from you would have to say that the Pope was part of that, the conciliar church, which if that's the case, he doesn't wish to belong to the church that the Pope is in. No. So that's, that's what I, that's what I'm saying about that. So, yeah, or he's speaking um, hyperbole. Let me yeah, add. Yeah, I can, um, that. Yeah. can you guys go hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can. Hear I go, oh, okay, okay. All right. My daughter is asleep again, so I can. <laughs> so, yeah. um, <clears throat> she, she has a really, really big opinion that she wants to share, but she fell asleep. So yeah, yeah. I'll have to share it for her. So here's what <laughs> Rosemary says about this. Um, so I'm going to read a quote and, and I'm going to reveal who it is at the end of this quote. This is from 1967. Here's the quote, quote, it is clear that the church is facing a grave crisis under the name of quote, the new church, quote, the post conciliar church, a different church from that of Jesus Christ is now trying to establish itself. An anthropocentric society threatened with imminentist apostasy, which is allowing itself to be swept along in a movement of general abdication under the pretext of renewal, ecumenism, or adaptation. End quote. Ratzinger. I think, yeah, Ratzinger. I saw your episode on it. Oh, <laughs> no, uh, it's not Ratzinger. What? 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 It's uh, Ratzinger's godfather oh, okay. in, the, in the theology. It's Henri de Lubac. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he sounds Henri, very schismatic. Yes. Yeah. Henri de Lubac, yeah. SJ. This is from Témonage Chrétien. This is Paris, September 1st, 1967. <laughs> it's a quote that Dietrich von Hildebrand put in the beginning of his book, Trojan, Trojan Horse in the City of God. The, the reason why it's different is because one is saying, for one, in quotations, number two, the idea that they're trying to, number three, uh, the third part would be, the difference would be in this particular situation, Lefebvre would have insisted not only that they tried to, but that they successfully hijacked the church and that the church has become one with the conciliar church, which he doesn't want to belong to. Um, that would be defectibility. I mean, at that point, you're no, talking. It no, it wouldn't. You it would have to be because you can't have one of the, the principal point of unity in the Catholic church is an essential. You can't have the principal point of unity in a hijacked church. So he believes he's the pope. He believes that there is a pope. He believes that there is a hierarchy, but the hierarchy itself, like the Arians, has gone astray. And therefore, St. Eusebius of Samosote, that's the, when you actually look at why Lefebvre decided to go, th okay, two, two things I want to mention before I forget. Yeah. Um, 
I want to talk about what happened at a CC real quick here, and I'm not doing it. I don't like to beat up on John Paul II. This isn't me. I'm not saber rattling here and being one of those guys who just gets angry. I couldn't care less. Honestly, I hope John. I, I believe John Paul II is in heaven. I believe he died a holy death. Um, I think he was given that death through Parkinson's to suffer for the grave sins that he had done as Pope. Um, and the, I, I don't think we conceptualize just how bad a CC was. It's not like you know, because I don't like the Buddhists or whatever. If you had read about something in the Old Testament, like Assisi, you would have read a, swiftly after that the people who participated would have been swallowed up by the earth. Um, if you had read about uh, something that happened at Assisi, you would have read, read that swiftly after Judas Maccabeus went out and made an army to come back and take back the temple from the pagan gods. You know, what happened at Assisi was, the, was one of the main reasons why Lefebvre decided to go through with the consecrations. Again, he was looking for a sign from Providence. He knew that he would have no justification historically in the church unless it was demonstrated by the hierarchy, like it was demonstrated by the Arians, that there was a grave crisis where he had to act in the position of what was called healer. And that was what St. Eusebius did. He said, the situation is too grave by all normal means, because again, God gives us priests. So on the one hand, we have this supernatural faith that God will take care of everything. But we also know, like, if you were in Japan and they kicked the priests out, you're kind of screwed. So you have to have the priests and you have to have an Orthodox faith. Um, if something happens to you and a calamity befalls you, then you accept it as best as you can. But you're not required to say, well, I believe there is no normal means to, to, to have these people's souls saved. But what am I to do about it? It's not my job to, you know, disobey the Pope. It's like if someone in Japan could have went in there and found a way to, you know, anyway, I'm getting off topic. Okay, so... What happens with Assisi? This is what happened in a spiritual sense. The Pope, the high priest of the Catholic Church, and the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ, he had God removed from the temple. That alone makes my... I mean, you can have a, the Eucharist taken out of a church to do something that is not profane. So, for example, you can have like a concert in there of good music, of sacred music or something like that. Um, but it's not, a, so they take, you know, I get that where you could have a, you could have a lay person speak in your church on Catholic topics. And if I was going to speak at a parish, for example, and the, uh, the Eucharist was front and center, I would actually ask them to move it for me because I wouldn't want to stand up there at the pulpit in the position of a priest. Um, I would feel weird about doing that, but that's different. That's not me going in there to preach heresy or pray to Satan. Um, so when these priests, priests and these shamans or whatever, I mean, there was various different religions. This would be like in the Old Testament, the high priest of the temple stands beside the priests of Baal and Moloch, and they do incantations to Satan and various devils. That is what happened at Assisi. Now he says, all pray in your own way, but if we believe scripture, we believe that the gods of the nations are devils. When Lefebvre saw this, after having lived through, I mean, he was converting people from worshiping totem poles in Africa for 40 years. Uh, and taking him out of the grips of Islam. He had every reason to believe that something, an irreparable and existential crime had taken place. And whatever crisis we were in, there was precedent in history that saints like St. Eusebius of Samosote said, there are normal means, which we follow canon law, which is a human law. And when the divine law is threatened, we have to obey God over man. He would have been wrong, for example, Lefebvre, if he had have set up diocese. One of my kids is waking up here. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go in two seconds here. They've been sick. Um, she's going to walk into my room right now and cry. Guys, I'm sorry to leave on that note. Um, oh, you're on, man. But he's co yeah. she's coughing and stuff. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. Okay. I got to go, boys. Yeah. Excellent. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, Paylor Krat, what are your thoughts? Well, I'd say this. Um, I'll be talking about actually a lot of this today. And not because I'm targeting the SSPX, because I'm not. I am targeting those who explicitly say that Rome has lost the faith, that there's no Pope, that there's been a, a massive defection within the church, um, that it's mutated into this monster, that it's a, a antichrist church, because those things are blasphemous, by the way. Like, it's blasphemy. It's riddled with heresy. Set of a contism is a wigwam of heresy. Um, whereas the um, uh, uh, SSPX, I would not make that contention. I have disagreements with them. I have differences of opinion about certain things, but I wouldn't go so far. However, um, just quoting from the book, right? He says, when therefore I see someone say 
Um, uh, I see someone who says that uh, these have fallen from uh, fallen into idolatry, talking about Rome. Okay, that they've corrupted the gospel, that they've committed all iniquities which fall up, uh, uh, follow upon the fall of religion. I will address myself to the church, whose judgment everyone must submit to. But if she can make mistakes, then it's no longer I or man who will uh, who will keep error in the world. It will be our God himself who will authorize it and give it credit since he commands us to go to the tribunal to hear and receive justice. Either he does not know what he's done there or he wishes to deceive us and true justice is really done there and the ju uh, and the judgments are irrevocable. The church, um, if anyone would uh, would further discuss this matter, I hold him as a heathen and a publican in order that I can obey my savior. The idea being that the for him for saint francis de sales and i fo i follow subscribe to this position that that the invincible argument from which the consequences are inescapable is matthew 18. if you have a problem with your brother you go to him if it's not resolved you get two or three witnesses if it's not resolved from there you bring it before the church and if the church makes a ruling and someone doesn't submit to it you treat that person like a heathen and a tax collector that's that's an invincible argument to use against Protestants because they have no church to go to. And because the very thing under dispute would be the very place that you'd have to go to. <laughs> so the idea is, well, we need to go back to the scriptures. You'll never hear them bring it to the church. <laughs> They'll say, well, we disagree. We brought the witnesses. What do you do? Go back to the Bible. <laughs> they won't go to the church. Um, the problem is, is that that's kind of this way here. That you say, on the one hand, we have to go back to a tradition. We don't go to the church because if the church makes a ruling, they could say we don't believe it. The church has made a ruling. The church is, has already moved forward on Vatican II. Church has already moved forward on the Novus Ordo. Church has already moved forward on a whole bunch of these things. So to say, well, no, I don't believe that. Well, where do you take it? Where do you take it? And who has the final say? And what if they took it there and the Pope said, nope, it is the way it is because that's what's already been done already right now or at least that these things are already settled i mean there's no i don't think there's any relitigating that in rome's opinion i don't think that it's like well when we get together we're going to talk about whether or not vatican ii is true <laughs> that's just not real that's fake that's larp land so i i think that at the end of the day if 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 it can't just simply be that the church has spoken and that when the church speaks on matters of faith morals government and discipline that that's the end of it and that we can then invoke the the higher law which by the way I'm not saying this is what the SSPX is doing. I'm not saying it's what 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 uh, um, Kennedy is doing. But every single enthusiast has done that. Every single one. And that's chapter one of this book to say that there's an idea of extraordinary mission, that that the person feels that the ordinary is no longer valid, that the ordinary is out and that they have an extraordinary mission now to invoke a higher law, divine law, going above and beyond the ordinary rather than through the ordinary. What, Kat, what what he contends here, St. Francis de Sales, and if I've got to pick and choose, I've already, I've already admitted earlier, and people can, anyone watching this, I already admitted that I think that uh, Marcel Lefebvre is an otherwise saintly man. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not denying that, but if I have to choose between an otherwise saintly man and a doctor of the church, I think you know where I'm going. And I would say that in, an, in, a, in a matter of extraordinary mission, even, the, even our Lord himself did not act in such a way. Even he was sent. Even he was one who was was sent by the father that he only said those things, right? That same thing with the apostles, the way that they behaved, same thing with the prophets in the Old Testament, the way they behaved, same thing with Moses, okay, talking about, and he goes through and he, it's amazing how he does it. He traces it all the way back and says, never do you have a situation where the ordinary, you, you can go against their lives, but you can't go against that throne. You can't, well, you cannot go against that, jur the juridical dynamic of their authority. And well, I think that, that that's an issue. Yeah, I think that is what you just said, going against their lives, but not their juridical authority. That's the distinction that let me, I'm going to bring this up. But first, let me get this awesome comment here from Andrea. Andrea has a great comment. He says, and ultimately our Lord will not ask us, did you attend the TLM? But have you been charitable, humble, pure? That said, I attend TLM. So I, I think that that's a fantastic comment because, you can have a perfect TLM, but if you offer it with pride, it's a stench in the nostrils of the Lord. Um, I think that what you just said, Peleocrat, I would try to counter what you're saying by simply saying, like, how much error can be possible 
in through the lives of the bishop through the the human element of the church as they say um how much damage can be done by members of the hierarchy by using because the enemies of the church know that there's a juridical structure they know that we're bound to that juridical structure. i think you're making all these really good points here jeremiah i think that's that's correct like you said like you will you go to the church well if you can't go to the church where you go but what if what if um there are all there's a situation where there's um all these enemies of christ trying to manipulate the situation um yeah. so because because i i think of what i thought of just now was the father sent jesus and he sent him into the holy family and the scripture says that he submitted to them so we have mary and joseph and so there's a tradition so obviously mary is sinless first of all but there's also a tradition that joseph was sinless from birth because it would be unbecoming of the son of god to disobey his human father so therefore his human father had to be sinless to always command him properly but we don't have those types of privileges in the church we don't have bishops who are sinless so that we obey them 100 percent as jesus obeyed joseph uh we do have fallen men who do it, act sinfully by means of their office so let's just close out um jeremiah do you have a final comment on some of that and then we'll, we'll yeah close out. well there's a there's a passage in here uh that i think goes perfectly with it and i wish that i had it on hand i'll talk about it today on the show but it basically is in the section talking about um talking about obedience and talking about what to do um in a situation where the church has spoken and he's like you do not judge you do not doubt um you do not disobey because the reason why is because there's underlying this for for two things number one my position on this is presuppositional and i believe his that's the case i'm making here is that he presupposes that the the church whenever the pope speaks on matters of, of, of faith morals government and discipline that that is preserved not by that man but that is preserved in a supernatural way and that's why the lay people don't have to like i joke around and say wear the monocle all the time otherwise we'd all have to keep our eyes on rome to make sure that everything's fine and that every single line is like man oh he passed muster this time like we don't do that that's why we're able to say the act of faith that says that uh you know we believe these and all the the other truths that the catholic church teaches because god right because he cannot deceive nor be deceived we don't say because we have a super smart pope with some really great writers and stuff. We don't, that's not even closer. We have a bunch of people with their monocles on making sure all the words are written just right. We don't, that's not the reason for the foundation for the faith that we have. It's because it's preserved. It's because it's a supernatural negative charism that preserves that. And we trust Christ on that because of his cross and that because of his cross that he died for the bride, that he knows, he knows the future from the past anyway, the past from the future. So he knows these things and he makes those promises in light of that. And says, yes, I will preserve this. I will guide you into all truth. And the church is the pillar and foundation of this, of these truths. And that we can't, there's no salvation outside of it. So if we sit there and we say, we trust those things, that is the for, the foundation of where we're standing. Um, the idea is no matter what happens, no matter what, those things that are meant for the general well-being of the church, that are meant to direct the flock and to feed the flock, that those things we can trust, not because of the men. I don't put trust in chariots and horsemen but because of the God that we serve and that God who died and who rose from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the father and preserves it with the Holy ghost until the end of the world. And so that's my Excellent. reason for believing. Hang on. Well, so tune in at 11 a.m. Yep. Eastern time, yep. right? Ho hopefully sometimes okay. Kaiser, Kaiser time, 11 to 1130. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tune yeah. in around 11 a.m. Eastern time, Kaiser time for uh paleo -Karat on this question so you you'll have further comments and um the one peter five podcast will also host peter kwashnevsky on this issue so i think watching these both of these shows together um jeremiah and peter kwashnevsky would probably cover a lot of both sides of the question i think so uh excellent well thank you very much jeremiah sorry that kennedy had to leave but he uh glad he could make the argument before he had to leave um so let's offer up a hail mary and uh ask that we always be accounted worthy to be 
true Catholics, faithful Catholics, pious Catholics, no one wants to be a schismatic. God save us from any sort of inkling of that. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. St. Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ Amen. is risen. Mm -hmm.